Uh, so yeah. thanks everybody uh, for coming to the uh, Rust MC. Uh, as uh, we said in the in the in the talk uh, in the Rust for Linux talk uh, on Monday, uh, it's the first time in the it's the second time we do a, an MC a Rust MC, but it's the first time Rust is uh, in the in the kernel. Uh, it's the first year that uh, we have an MPC where Rust is already in the kernel, uh, and we have a bunch of talks that are very very good. Uh, I think. You are going to enjoy all of the talks. Uh, we couldn't get too much into the technical details uh, on Monday, uh, but the presenters today will will give you some technical, real technical details, and I think you will really enjoy uh, the talks. And we have some uh, nice uh, announcements, I will say, or, or I don't want to spoil anything. So I will let uh, start uh, uh, with the first talk. So Gary uh, has worked; he's in the core team uh, of Rust uh, in the kernel. He has uh, experience in the compiler, in, in, in the Rust language, uh, in kernels. So he has a, a, a lot of knowledge and he has prepared a new tool that I think uh, you will find very, very interested in you if you are interested in prevention counts, locking, uh, you know, contexts, etc. In, in the kernel. So thank you very for presenting and being the first. Uh, good luck. And uh, I think you, you're on. So whenever you want to start, please go ahead. Great. Um... Thank you everyone for coming uh, to my talk. So um, I'm going to introduce a new tool called Klint. Uh, it's designed to be uh, capable of detect multiple uh, kind of code misuse, but um, one of the first links that have been implemented is the uh, compile time detection of atomic context violations. So um, be before I talk about the, what the tool can do and how to use it, um, first I need to get into some background about why this tool is needed. So the so first is, when we first is, uh, this is very important thing is to get the uh, actual term correct, right? When we say Rust is safe, Rust is safe, and what does actually mean that Rust is safe? So the safety of Rust is basically it's something's property, which is safe Rust code cannot cause undefined behavior. And in this, Context undefined behavior includes uh, dereferencing, uh, dereference, uh, mangling, uh, dangling uh, now or online pointer, like for example, user for free, or also uh, double free. These are undefined behavior. And buffer overrun is undefined behavior. Data resist is undefined behavior. And uh, break alias rule is undefined behavior, et cetera, et cetera. But there are also a few things that are not undefined behavior. Uh, which is, for example, memory leak uh, is not con considered undefined behavior in, in Rust. Therefore, safe Rust code can leak memory. And deadlock is not undefined behavior. And similarly, panic or abort are, or kernel bug or kernel panic, they, these are also un not undefined behavior. So they can be triggered by uh, Rust code. Um, it, it's not saying that these are good, saying that um, like kernel can panic, right? It's, it's just that um, in, in Rust terms, uh, Safe program can safely trigger panic. That's that's just a correctness issue, not a soundness issue. So uh, it, now we look at some bad code, right? You can obviously this is bad code because you're using a mutex lock while a spring lock is being held. This is a very clear context violation. But we also we all know this can happen by accident, especially when code is complex. We have multiple level of nesting. So in, in Rust, there's no compile time guarantee that this won't happen. Um, is this safe? Well, yes, because uh, just as I mentioned in last slide, dialog is considered safe uh, in Rust terms. So if this is bad, it's a correctness issue, but it's safe regardless. But if we switch from spring lock to RCU lock, then things are a little bit different. We, we can see, is this there's a similar, very similar back code where uh, it's a context violation. You call schedule when you're inside the reside RCU critical section. But if I ask a question, is this safe again? The answer is a little bit different. So um, just in case any, anyone's, I'm pretty sure the audience is very uh, familiar with RCU in the kernel, but in case somebody is uh, from more on the Rust side is listening, I just give a very brief introduction to the RCU. This is a very simple RCU uh, use case where uh, just one of, one of thread is doing a read, and one of the thread is doing an update. 
But if we look at what this compiles to, if config preempt R series off, then you, you can see the read lock and read unlock is basically compiled into preempt disable enable. If the preempt count is off, then they are just turned into barriers, and which which is basically just a compiler fence uh, with no instruction being generated at all. So how does this work? Um, this this works because synchronized RCU returns after a contact switch has happened on all CPUs, and we we know that it's a context violation when you try to sleep inside the atomic context, and therefore. Um, Context switch will not happen inside RCU reside critical section. But this only works by assuming that there's nothing to nothing guaranteeing that context switch will never happen inside RCU reside critical section. Well, that, that is if you disable the um, atomic context debugging. If, if we visit this bad code, you can see that sleep inside RCU reside critical section breaks assumption of synchronized RCU. In this, is, in this case, uh, we get some user for free uh, just by exploiting the context violation without actually um, trigger any buffer overrun or otherwise. So this is why it's, it's important because atomic context violation does not only cause deadlock, but it cause user for free, which is a memory safety issue. And if we combine this, Right. So, so yeah. So this is essentially uh, not only a correctness requirement, but also safety requirement that we never have atomic context misuse. This is fine in C because there's no distinction between safe and unsafe. So you just look at code and say, okay, this is broken because this is an atomic context violation, and, and well, it might trigger um, it, it might trigger CVE, but there's like nothing saying. Um, it's it's bad, but it's there's no uh, distinction between currentness bad or safety bad. But combining this with the sunness property with Rust, which is basically saying safe Rust code cannot cause undefined behavior and it's, and therefore should not cause risk of free. This means that we must not design a safe API that allows Rust kernel code uh, to sleep inside atomic context. And this is very hard actually. So how can we actually solve this issue? Um, well, we all, this easiest solution is actually to make sleep unsafe, right? If sleep is unsafe, then contact switch is unsafe. Therefore, um, you can't uh, trigger uh, atomic context violation with just safe Rust code because you, you can't sleep with safe Rust. You have to, uh, whenever you make, you, you call a function that needs to sleep, uh, you have to say uh, safety comment, this function is called outside atomic context, and therefore um, it can sleep. But this is obviously a bad idea because it's make API design very um, horrible and ergonomic. Another possible solution is to use token types, which is basically like a dense with type system that um, gives you all the uh, type safe, uh, all the safety with, without actually having much overhead in the generated code. So in this case, we can have a token for printing atomic context and process and then we use this um, kind of tricks to ensure that there's only one type of uh, one single token that alive across the whole execution of program. So if, for example, if a function needs to sleep, it will need to take a mutual reference of a process context token, so which asserts a bit to sleep. And when you look, lock a spin lock, you have to take away whatever token is given to for the atomic, uh, for whatever context you are currently in and transition you into an atomic context. Well, this also, I mean, this solved the issue of um, addressing the uh, sleeping cell atomic uh, misuse, but this also basically infect all the functions that uh, need either change the atomic, change the context, or have to assert a context, which also is very horrible in terms of usability. We have another possible solution, which is a dynamic check, because in preemptive kernel, we already have a runtime preemption count. And preempt enable and disable will tweak this count. So we can just check um, this count before sleeping to ensure that we never uh, sleep in the atomic context. We can just, for example, if you try to sleep in the atomic context, we can just turn into a, a bug. And this is essentially what config debug atomic, atomic sleep is doing. But obviously, this is a debug option and it's not enabled, always enabled. 
and if we can't change this to always enable this, um, but this obviously have a runtime overhead, um, so which is also not ideal. Or we can have another possible solution, which is just ignore the problem at all. We would just use the whatever pro API design that we have currently, and we just trust the developer, um, just like what we currently do for our C code. And uh, we, we can ask the developer to use LockDap and debug Atomic Sleep when they're developing their program um, to, to find out if, if, um, if there's actually a bug. Um, but we, we just uh, don't always enable it. Well, this is technically unsound um, in, 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 in Rust because you can technically write a safe program. If you do not enable debug options, then the safe program can uh, cause memory safety issues. So, so basically, we are currently in a, in, a, in a dilemma, right? We have three things that we want to optimize for. We have one soundness, we want no runtime cost, and, but we also want an economic API. So if we use token types, then we kind of trade so that we have no runtime cost and we, are, we have a sound API design, but it's not very economic. If, if we have runtime check, it's sound and it's economic, but it obviously have runtime cost. Oh, if we ignore this, then we, 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 it's just like our current C code, we have economic API and we have no runtime cost, but it's not some. So Kate is basically trying to add something in the middle where um, it's both sound, no runtime cost, and has an economic API. Obviously, this is a very hard uh, problem to solve. So um, we first need to look at the rationale why Kate is uh, trying to do. So first, we have to recognize that our need does not fit into the Rust safety model, because without type complex type system dancing or runtime check, it's not feasible to have an economic API, or like you can't choose all three of these uh, desired properties. But we can extend the compiler to provide what we need, and we are not the first project to do this, because Servo also use a custom plugin to the compiler to do some checking to ensure that. Um, GC roots uh, on the stack are properly rooted. So if if you run the server without this custom plugin, then you can actually get into you suffer free issues because the JavaScript side will just free the uh, memory without if the Rust side is not rooting it properly on the stack. So what Katie is trying to do is to check atomic context misuse during compilation time as extensive as possible, but Oh, we always want the developers to get full control of uh, how things uh, behave. So for that, once that can't be checked, um, we should provide the escape hatch. So it can be over, either override with runtime check or with an unsafe statement so that it's like they can actually get things to compile if necessary. So these are five design goals of Kading. So at, at first, it have to be very simple to either, for either to understand or uh, explain. Um, which actually determine that Kaling will not just turn your program into very complex constraint and give it to a solver because that will not very give very useful information and the programmers wouldn't be easy to it wouldn't be easy for programmers um, developers to understand what's going on inside this tool. It has to provide useful diagnostics um, and as I just mentioned in the last slide, uh, provide escape hatch to give full control when necessary. It need to be have a same default, so it requires little annotation as possible, um, so that it wouldn't be too much friction just uh, to get this tool running. And also, it had to be fast because we want to make it part of compi every compilation instead of a tool that you run once in a while or just enable in debug build, like um, or the debug configs. So. Here's what uh, Kaling is trying to enforce the role. Each function is given two properties. The adjustment, which is the preemption count after calling a function. So the preemption, uh, it's basically the, the preemption count in the kernel. So Kaling is running as if preemption count is enabled. And it will try to track possible range of preemption counts. So each function given, one, one of them is adjustment, which is what's the preemption count after the function is called uh, relative to the, to the function's entry. And then another one is expected value when calling the function at the entry point of this function. So these are all approximations. So adjustment can must be an integer, and um, 
So a function cannot return with different preemption counts adjustments and the expected value must be a range. So it cannot represent things like a zero or two, for example. Um, some examples of properties of function is like spin lock, RC relock. They just adjust preemption count, incre increase them by one, and they can take any uh, arbitrary preemption counts. Uh, I'm ignoring the um, the real, real time kernel and the row spin lock here, but in practice, I think it can just be approximate with two preemption counts, one for the RT and one for not. And for spin unlock, it's basically decrement the preemption count by one and expect to be one or higher. This is also very straightforward. And other sleep operations, sleepable operations like music operations, they will just adjust this preemption count by zero and they expect uh, the preemption count to be exactly zero. So here's how you actually annotate the um, properties in with, with Klint. So there are two types of annotations in Klint. One of them is unchecked annotations, which is usually applied for FFI functions or for functions that you need the escape hatch because Klint is not um, cannot infer properties um, for this function. So for example, the, the, this is um, just. This is basically the same as the, the last slide, except it's using the Rust range notation instead of uh, mathematical notations. So zero dot dot means from zero to infinity, essentially. And uh, in Kaling, there's also a, a check annotation, which is you give a, an, um, a function annotation and Kaling will actually check it for you without without assuming it. And, and this can be more strict than what's, what's, what can be inferred. So if you want to have an annotated function to be only callable from atomic context, you can say this expects uh, zero dot dot. So it expects any preemption count. Therefore, it must be able to call by any, inside any context. And, and Kaling is trying to infer for a ma majority of the cases so that as little annotation is ne needed uh, for the developers as possible. And for generic functions, um, it's, it's a note because generic functions can have different uh, preemption count adjustment depending on the, the type parameters. Each monomorphized instance is inferred separately. So, um, so you, you can have generic functions. You can have like algorithms that work on a variety of data structures and have a different instantiation, have different preemption counts, and getting to support that. Uh, there are a few cases where annotation is absolutely necessary. Um, th these include uh, F5 boundaries, and this also in, um, include recursive functions because the Kaling is trying to do things as locally as possible. So it it does not want to have a um, all the requirement generated uh, for for the whole kernel and then try to solve these. So um, for recursive functions, you in some cases you need to annotate them, uh, but in some cases you don't. Uh, in in most cases, if uh, annotation necessary, Kaling will actually give you a Hint, say you can try to annotate this recursive function with this annotation and it will should just work out. And there's one, one exception in which um, it does not have the ability to infer, which is indirect function calls. So this includes function pointers and trait objects. But uh, for function object, currently there's no good way to annotate them. So, um, so currently, if, if there's a violation detected by Kaling across function pointers, it will just give you a warning. But for trait object, you can actually annotate on trait method. So things will just walk. So, so here I want to show show you a, a case study, uh, which is the very first time that I run Kaling on the actual Russell Linux kernel, and um, it turns out inference work for most functions. Um, apart from FFI, apart from FFI functions, the only place where annotation node is required is on the arc wake trait. So this is part of the K async, the kernel asynchronous runtime using Rust futures. Uh, I think it's powered by work queues. And um, as, as part of this, uh, we, we have a trait called arc wake. This is very similar to the uh, standard library wake trait. But uh, we implement this for our custom kernel archetype instead of the kernel uh, standard library provided archetype. So we, we have uh, our separate arc wake definition. And this has two, two fun functions, two methods, uh, wake by ref and wake. And um, in so by default, um, Kaling will assume indirect functions can can sleep, 
So in, in this case, I have to override that uh, assumption by explicitly marketing that, uh, marking that um, wake by ref and wake uh, must expect preemption count of um, zero to infinity. So they must be callable from atomic context. And the reason for doing this is that a wake function, wake functions are called from wake up. And in this case, it, it has a spin lock or row spin lock. I couldn't remember the, which one is it. Um, but it's, it's definitely inside atomic contact and therefore cannot sleep. So um, Keynes is, is complaining that uh, these functions can sleep and, and giving me a violation. So I have to, have to annotate with uh, this annotation so that uh, Keynes is happy. But it turns out after annotating this, Keynes gave me a different error and it actually is a bug. So this is the error that Kaling gives me. Um, this is actually just a, sn a snippet of the whole error, which is um, two pages long, um, which is one thing that I have to optimize because uh, it's not, um, currently the error message is not as friendly as possible. Um, can, you, um, can people see this, this slide or do I have to zoom it somehow? Uh, I think we can see we can see all of the text barely the the first line, but we we can see it. Can can you not see the first line? You mean? No, we we can we can. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. So so in this this case, it is an actual there's actual bug uh, in the program that's being detected, uh, which is um, if if you have a if you have an executor and you you spawn a, a task onto it, and you later cancel the task. Um, there's in in the in the code that um, in the AK async code in the Rust branch, the the waker itself actually have a strong reference to this this task. So th this means if you um, spawn a task, do something, uh, add it to a wait wait queue, and then cancel the task, it, 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 what will happen is that um, the the task will not be dropped. So everything will still um, is, is still there's still one live reference to it, and um, Later, when interrupt happens, for example, and then it's um, th this task is waked up, this will be the last copy of it. It will be dropped, and in this case, it will recursively drop the task, drop the executor, etc., and which all happens in atomic context. And but this this method cannot be called inside atomic context. So this is indeed an atomic context violation, and it's um, I mean it's it's fixable, but it's not very straightforward. So it turns out this is an actual bug. I what I originally think didn't really trust Kaling that much. So I think, oh, maybe there's something wrong with my program. But it turns out this is an actual bug that um, has to be solved. But it turns out it's, even though it's, the tool is still in its infancy, it's already um, proving to be quite useful. Uh, get it, but, five minutes. Great. Um, so th this is what the tool is capable now, but obviously it's, um, will have some limitations. So one of the limitations is currently it does not uh, handle conditional log equation very, very well. So this, for this try log function, because the preemption count adjustment can either be zero or one, depending on what, which variant is actually being returned. Um, currently, this is not representable inside Kalings. Um, I have some plan to improve upon that. Uh, it might take form like this, where a just can take a, a expression that uh, represent using like variant, you can kind of switch based on the variant of the return value, but this is still yet to be implemented. Uh, I should know that a conditional log acquisition for mutex is fine um, because it, it, it does not change adjust, uh, the pressure count just, um, adjustment. Another limitation is currently um, killing does not read about var uh, values of variables. So data depend log acquisition also doesn't work. In, in this case, um, even we as, as um, human, it's very easy to see that um, the spin lock and unlock can only happen if uh, take lock is, is true. So either they are locked and unlocked or nothing will happen. But uh, currently this is not detectable by, by killing. So what well, killing will say, okay, this function can either increment preemption count by one or decrement by one or change nothing. And this is broken. And so this is another thing that I have to add. I will have to address, and that's my on my agenda. Uh, note that if you use a implicit, if you use the um, drop guard pattern, uh, Rust will synthesize a drop drop flag, so that it will take us exactly back into the previous slide. 
So this, this kind of pattern also doesn't really work well with scaling currently. Another limitation is with how Rust C currently generate code. So if we have things on the, on the top, you can see um, there's no case where uh, if let does not if, if let does not hold, then there's nothing to be dropped. But Rust C will currently insert a drop X uh, in this else branch because it's using if let and Rust C does not see that um, it, it, it's the only case where it, it's not going to hold will not require dropping X. So Rusty will generate a little drop, and uh, which Klint will see as potentially change the preemption count. So this will also be complained by Klint. Um, this this is also something that need to be fixed. And actually, this is the the only factor I believe that blocks Klint from wider testing because Binder has a lot of these patterns, and um, so Klint currently does all run on Binder code. Yeah, that's all um, from me. Uh, if you want to know uh, some details about how it's implemented, you can either look at the code as a uh, repository, or you can refer to my slide um, that I gave in the in Kangaroo host, which contains some more information details. And there's also a link if you are curious about how servos implement their compiler plugins. Thank you very much.